So we're kind of done with camps for the year, and one of the ways we fund camps, uh, sending kids and teens off to camp, is through our anniversary fund, our anniversary offerings. When people are married a certain number of years, they often will give a offering corresponding to those years. So this morning in first service, Katie and John Hackett celebrated 12 years of marriage, so we praise God for that. So that's awesome. This is, our, this is our 14th week. We're bringing it in for landing. This is our 14th week of this series of sermons looking at the slaves coming from Egypt, coming to the promised land. And I want to begin this morning, uh, first of all, turn, to, turn, in the, turn in your Bibles to the fourth book in the Old Testament. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. We've been in the book of Exodus for 13 weeks. Now we've just skipped a big chunk of, of Scripture. In, in all actuality, we've, we've kind of raced over about a year in time. And we'll cover that here in just a second, briefly. But I want to I share a story with you this morning. If you're familiar with an author, his name is Bob Goff. Anybody recognize the name Bob Goff? Goff, F-G-O-F-F. Um, what you need to know about Bob Goff is he's from California. That's it, okay? So things that make sense to Bob Goff and in Bob Goff's world may or may not make sense to you here in Tennessee. California, it's his own group of people. And so Bob Goff, in the, uh, in the late 70s, he was a college student in San Diego. And as many Californians did in the late 70s, they just decided to take some time off and hitchhike. Because that's what you do, I guess. And he was a student down at San Diego State, and he wanted to go see San Francisco. And so he just decided to take some time off and go to San Francisco and hitchhike. And he says this in his book, Love Does. I'd highly recommend anything that Bob Goff writes. And he says this in Love Does. He says, there's an unwritten rule when you hitchhike that, that he learned pretty quickly through experience. When a car pulls over to give you a ride, instead of telling the person where you need to go, Ask them where they're going. There's a big difference. Because when you say, hey, where are you going? It gives you a second or two to check them out and see if you want to get in the car with them. If you say, hey, where are you going? And they say, well, actually, there's this great body odor convention in Oakland. <laughs> then you say, mm, I was there last year. Thanks a lot, but I'll catch the next ride, okay? So it gives you a second, and, and here's what he wrote in, in that story. Here's what he wrote. I learned that even though I needed a ride to get somewhere, I had a lot of power over who I hitched a ride with. You have a lot of power over who you ride with. You have a lot of power over you hit your wagon with. You have a lot of power over who you surround yourself with. The voices you listen to and the story we are going to look at today speaks into that very strongly. And so let me remind you, God came to a man named Abraham in the book of Genesis and said, Abraham, I'm going to build my nation, my people through you. And he made a covenant with Abraham. And he renewed that covenant with his son Isaac and Isaac's son Jacob. And all of Jacob's family ends up in Egypt. For 400 years, Egypt enslaves the Israelites and they call out to God for rescue and help from slavery and God sends Moses. Moses goes to Pharaoh and through Moses, God leads the people out of slavery. About two months after they come out of slavery, God gives them his law, the Ten Commandments. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago. About four, five, six weeks after God gives them the law, they blow it in colossal fashion. And we looked at the story of the golden calf last week, and that is in the book of Exodus. And so right after the story of the golden calf, when they worshiped an idol, right after that story, God gives uh, more law. God tells them how he wants them to live. God gives them instruction on how to build a tabernacle, and they build the tabernacle. And so now it's about a year later. In the book of Numbers, where we're going to be this morning, this story is about a year after that. So it's been about a year and a half since they were in slavery. 
So we're going to start in the book of Numbers chapter 13 today, and I'm going to uh, have you remain seated off and we'll stand up in reverence of God's word. Uh, but I'm going to read quite a bit again this morning, and I want you to sit down. Starting in Numbers chapter 13, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to you. Now remember, God has brought his people, the Israelites, the, slave in, the slaves in Egypt, and he is bringing them to the promised land, a land that belongs to God, but that other people are living there. Now, it could have been a walk across the desert of a few weeks. Even the colossal number of people, hundreds of thousands, maybe a million people, could have made the walk from Egypt to the promised land in just a few weeks. Because of what God has done, because of the route he's taken them on, it's taken them about a year and a half, but they're here. We're here. The promised land, it's right there. And God says, send some men over to make a report. Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, Send one of its leaders. So the Lord commanded Moses. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them from the desert. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. Go ahead to uh, verse 17. Verse 17, when Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev and into the hill country. See what the land is like. Whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many? What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they have? Are they unwalled or are they fortified? What's the soil like? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in the land? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit. So they went up and explored the land. Moses sent one representative from every one of the families, from every one of the tribes. He sent 12 spies. Joe taught you how to speak French this morning. He didn't use the proper pronunciation. Because you, when you speak French, you have to add, ha ha. <laughs> so work on that. Okay, so he spent, he, Moses sends 12 spies into the promised land to scout it out, to see what it's like, and then to bring them back to get a report. Verse 25, at the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. Verse 26, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community. There they reported to them and the whole assembly and showed them some of the fruit. It was big fruit. That's a story for another time. It was in the middle of that passage that we skipped over. They gave Moses this account. This is what the land is like. We went into the land which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Remember God promising us a, a homeland? When we were slaves in Egypt, he said, I'm going to give you a land. It's going to be a good land. I'm going to give it to you. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's going to be everything you need. And the spies come back and said, it does flow with milk and honey. It's a fertile land. But the people who live there, they're powerful. And the cities are large and strong. We even saw descendants of Anak there. There are giants in the land. They're huge. Verse 30. But Caleb, one of the spies, but Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, let's go. We should go. We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Ten spies say, oh, the people are big. They're giants. The cities are strong. They have walls. The walls are so, so tall. The walls are so, so thick. The, the, the people there, they're giants. We're puny, tiny humans compared to them. We can't. Two spies, Caleb and Joshua, go, Let's go. We're here. 
Over here is slavery in the desert and the wilderness. And over here is the land that God has brought us to. Let's go. You know what happens? You know? Do you know? Do you know? Verse 14, chapter 14. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. God has brought them to the promised land. And now because of 10 of the 12 spies, they're not going. They're scared to death. They wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to the land only to let us fall by the sword? Because those people over there in the promised land, they're so, so big and their towns are so, so strong. They're like giants. We are teeny tiny little humans. There's no way we could do that. Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it have been better for us to go back to Egypt? They said this to each other. We should choose a new leader and go back. Can I tell you the rest of the story? So here's what happens. God gets upset. God gets upset. God has heard the slaves pray, call out to him, God, help, we're in slavery. God, come rescue your people. God, come restore your people. This can't be what you had in mind when you made a covenant to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We are your chosen people. Our destiny is not slavery. Our destiny is freedom. God, come rescue us, bring us out of slavery. Take us to a land that is yours, that you are giving us. And God does it. And then they send 10, 12 spies into the land. 10 of them come back scared. And so the people won't go. Here's what happens. Folks, man, I hate to break it to you, but when we don't follow what God wants in our lives, there are often consequences. When we, don't go against, when we don't do what God wants for our lives, when we go against what God wants in our lives, we call that sin. When we know what God wants us to do because he's been very plain about it, and when we rebel and do our own thing, it's called sin, and sin brings consequences. Here's the consequences. All of God's people who left Egypt, all of them, all of the slaves who left slavery in Egypt and have been guided right to the brink of the promised land, all of them that were 20 and over died in the wilderness. They wander around the wilderness. God makes them wander around the wilderness for 40 years. And every one of them but two, Caleb and Joshua, Everyone who left Egypt under 20 and Caleb and Joshua saw the promised land. Everyone who left Egypt and saw God's power, saw the plague, saw the exodus, saw the, the water rush back in over the Egyptian chariots. Every one of them who saw God provide water and food in the wilderness got, saw the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. Every one who was 20 and over, including these 10 spies, died in the wilderness. And 40 years later, God brings them right back to the point that we talked about this morning. Amen. There are consequences to not following what God wants us to do. Now, perhaps yours aren't as dramatic as this. Sometimes they are. And let me ask you this question. Bob Goff would say, you have a lot of power over who you ride with. Who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? Twelve spies go into the promised land and bring back a report. Now what Moses sent them to do was go bring us back a report. Are the people there big or are they small? Are the cities large or small? What's the soil like? What's the fruit like? What are the crops like? Are the city, do the cities have big walls or little walls? Are they tall? Are they thick? Bring us back a report. Ten men came back and brought an opinion. Oh, we can't go there. They're huge. 
Have you seen the size of those people? We can't go there. We're slaves. We still, we still have that smell of slavery on us. We're out here being dusty in the wilderness. We can't go. Over. We can't do that. Caleb and Joshua says, let's go. Let's go. And the people listen to the 10. Just a little tip in case you didn't know. The majority's not always right. Amen. 10 out of 12 is a firm majority. We would call that a landslide. All right? If we're just lifting hands, 10 out of 12 carries the motion. God's ways are not always directed by a majority. Amen. God's ways are not always shouted loudly. The, the Bible uses again and again a picture of how God whispers. God is in the quiet. This morning we were listening to a, a pastor preach and he said that's because God is close. He is near. He doesn't have to shout. Amen. We just have to listen. Don't listen to the majority when the majority sows seeds of doubt and fear. Don't listen to the loudest voice just because it's loud. Ten spies come back and say, we can't. Caleb and Joshua says, let's go. And the people turned and spent 40 years in a death march around the wilderness. Let me share this story with you. Years ago, Pacific Northwest, they, uh, they had a program where they were offering a reward of $500 for every wolf killed or captured. And so, of course, that turned a bunch of people into bounty hunters. And so two hunters, Sam and Jed, two hunters decided to head for the hills and make a bunch of money hunting wolves. Day after day after day, day and night, they scoured the mountains and forests searching for their valuable prey. Exhausted after days of hunting with no success, they hadn't seen a wolf. They fall into a deep sleep in front of their campfire. During the night, Jed wakes up to the sound of growling and he sticks his finger in the flap of the tent and opens it just enough to look out and they are surrounded by 50 bared teeth, red eyes reflecting the flames in their eyes, growling wolves preparing to attack. Jed nudges Sam awake and says, Sam, we're dead. Sam looks out and says, we're rich. <laughs> That's the difference between the 10 and the two. Who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? Well, last summer we, we talked about it, it, it is consequential what you eat, what we feed on affects our bodies. When the people fed on the report of the 10, they spun around the wilderness for 40 years and everybody who was 20 and over when, uh, at the time of the exodus died in the wilderness. They listened to the loudest voices. They listened to the majority. Folks, who are you listening to? You've got a lot of power on who you ride with. You've got all the power in the world on who you listen to. If we just, by default, sit back and listen to the majority, if we just, by default, listen to the loudest voice, it will very rarely be the Word of God. It wasn't in Jesus' day. Amen. Jesus wasn't the majority. When Jesus ascended back to heaven, and he left Peter and the apostles, and they planted a whole movement with 120 of them, they weren't the majority. When Paul went on missionary journeys, planting churches, he would go make one convert, plant a church. Go to the next town, make one convert, plant a church. He'd go on to the next town. He wasn't a majority against the Roman Empire. And folks, we, as the church today, we're not a majority now. 
There was a time in our culture that we might have thought that we were the majority, but I don't know that we ever have been. We are not the loudest voice in the room. We have never been, perhaps will never be until Jesus comes again. The majority. Who are you listening to? Let me ask one more question. What kind of voice will you be? What kind of voice will you be out there? Does your voice just mimic the loudest voice out there? Does your voice just mimic what's the majority out there? What kind of a, what kind of a voice are you using? I love this. I love this quote. A, a pastor buddy of mine said this. You get to choose every day what you fill your life with. So choose wisely. It sounds a lot like Bob Goff. You need a ride? but you have a lot of control over who gives you a lift. There's a man and his wife that have marriage ministry. His name is Dave Willis. And he said these words. If you're wondering how to tell whether a message is from God or not, here's one litmus test. Any message that causes more fear and rage and entitlement and resentment is not from God. Any message that causes you to have more love and faith and courage and selflessness is from God. So when you listen to the voices, oh no, we can't go into the promised land. Oh, they're so, so strong. Oh, those towns are so, so big. They're, we're like ants to them. They're huge. We're teeny, teeny, tiny, weak humans. We can't go there. That's sowing doubt and fear and disparaging God's power, his purpose, and his promises. But the voice of Caleb and of Joshua saying, here we are. Let's go. We're home. Faith, love, hope, determination, not based on their strength, but on God's strength. That's the voice of God. That's the voice we need to follow. Would you stand up with me? Amen. You get to choose who you ride with. You get to choose the voices you hear. There's a world out there in our culture that screams. Just because it screams doesn't make it right. Amen. And it certainly doesn't make it God's voice. Just because there's more of them than more of you doesn't make it right. We listen for God's voice. Often God's voice is still and small. And we've got to dial it back a little bit to hear it. Because God is close. He speaks to us constantly. He speaks through his word. He speaks through worship. He speaks through church. He speaks through his Holy Spirit, his still small voice. But folks, we've got to listen for it. He's guiding us. He's bringing us to a good, spacious land. He's bringing us to a promised land. He wants good things for us, but we've got to follow him to get there. Even if you've blown it today, here's good news. You can start fresh now. Amen. You can start again now. You can recognize, you know, I've listened to a whole lot of voices that weren't of him. I'm going to change who I listen to. I'm going to listen for his voice. I'm going to look at his character, his promises, his word. And I'm going to follow him. God is a rescuing God. God is a restoring God. He wants to provide for us the promised land. He doesn't kick us over the river to get there. He goes before us and asks us to follow. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray together. God, remind us again this morning who you are. Amen. Remind us again today of your character. 
Remind us today again of your promises. Remind us again of what you want to do in us, in our families, in our marriages, with our children and grandchildren, in our communities, where we work, where we go to school. God, remind us again of what you want to do through your church, through your people. Remind us again today that you love the world. God sent his son because God loved the world. God is a rescuer. God is a redeemer. And we get to continue that work today. God, we so quickly forget. Remind us who you are. Tweak our ears that we don't just automatically listen for the loudest voice. We just don't look around the room and see where the majority is going, that we look for you. Keep us, God, on target. Help us to be people of faith and love, reflecting that God who showed himself in Jesus. God, we thank you for what you're going to do in advance that you do it. In your great name we pray, amen.